I'm uh, Max Abramson, a state representative representing the Seacoast. Um, in your opinion, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of self-defense cases. Is there anything that can be done uh, legislatively to improve people's right to act in self-defense? Thank you. That's a great question. Is there anything we can do legislatively now? A number of things were done legislatively in response to the Ward Bird uh, issue. And New Hampshire did make some really great changes to um, self-defense laws. Our self-defense laws in New Hampshire are, uh, are, are pretty good. Uh, and in terms of, you know, there could be issues where it's tweaking, but we do not have to retreat. There's no duty to retreat in New Hampshire. Some people call that the castle doctrine, but it really isn't castle. It's uh, castle's about being in your home. New Hampshire goes further. It's it's a uh, where you don't have to retreat if you're in a place where you have a right to be. So if you're justified in using deadly force, uh, the way it works is this: you. Well, I'll tell you what. Want to learn a little bit about self-defense and what? Let me show you this here. And this is important, and I'll give you some really great tips. 627.4 is justification in New Hampshire. Now, justification is the legal word for self-defense. What it means is justification for the use of force. In this case, with a firearm, deadly force. So justification for the use of force in defense of a person. So when can you use deadly force to defend yourself in New Hampshire? Now if you go to my website at efmappen.com, I have a one page, quick and dirty, that explains what I'm gonna tell you right here. So if you get those things in your mind, you'll know when you're able to actually use deadly force. Now deadly force is the firing of a gun at or about a person or near the vehicle. And, and you know, we're talking here about firearms, but uh, that is the key. So when can you use deadly force? As a, as a person is justified in using deadly force upon another person when he reasonably believes that such other person is about to use unlawful deadly force against the actor or third person. So when can you use deadly force? When are you justified in using deadly force? When you reasonably believe Right? That such other person is about to use unlawful deadly force against you or somebody else. So let me ask you this. What's a reasonable belief? That's what 12 people who aren't smart enough to avoid jury duty think it is. Keep that in mind. So we had better really be reasonable in your belief. Because that collective mindset is going to determine just how reasonable that belief was. Okay? But if you are correct, and your reasonable belief is justified that you can use deadly force. When else can you use deadly force in New Hampshire? There's only four occasions, just four. We just did one. Here's the other. You're justified in using deadly force when you reasonably believe that the other person is likely to use unlawful force against a person present while committing or attempting to commit a burglary. What does that mean? I'll tell you. What's a burglary? Well, burglary is not just someone breaking your house to steal. Burglary is breaking into an occupied dwelling with the intent to commit a crime. So, a person who breaks into a house to rape someone is actually still a burglar. Okay? Because burglary is not just theft, but we often think of it as that. So, if a person is about to commit or attempting to commit a burglary, and there is a threat that they're going to use unlawful force, not deadly force. You can use deadly force against that burglar. So, if you encounter in your house a burglar, but that burglar was not likely to use any force against you, you can't shoot that burglar. It's not open season on burglars. In order for you to be able to use deadly force, that burglar has to be likely to use any unlawful force. Now, that could mean he's about to hit you, that he's about to grab your gun away from you, something like that, okay? Unlawful force and burglary. What else can you use deadly force? You can use deadly force when you reasonably believe that a person is committing 
or about to commit kidnapping or forcible sex offense. You can use deadly force if a person, if you, you have to reasonably believe, is committing or about to commit kidnapping or rape. Then you can use deadly force. That's the third, right, third ability there. Kidnapping or rape, but you better be right, okay? And you know, you might see some kid screaming, you know, being taken out of a, 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 a shopping mall, and you, know, you can't assume that's a kidnapping. Just like you can't assume something is a rape. You better be darn sure, okay? Because that reasonable belief in that jury is gonna look back on your actions and see how reasonable you were as to what you believed and why. And finally, you can use deadly force if you're likely to use, if a person is likely to use any unlawful force in the commission of a felony against the actor within such actors dwelling or curtilage. So if someone is about to use force in the commission of a felony in your home or on your property, uh, then you can use it. That's it. Those are the only times you can use deadly force when you're justified in the use of deadly force in New Hampshire. That's it. So, if you fall under one of those categories and you use deadly force, you're good, right? No, you're not good. Because what the law gives, the law taketh away, and here's how they take it away. They say a person is not justified in using deadly force to defend himself or a third person from deadly force if the other knows that he and the third person can, with complete safety, that's always been in the law, Retreat from the encounter, except he is not required to retreat if he is within his dwelling or curtilage and was not the initial aggressor. So, what does that mean? It means you cannot use deadly force if you are able to retreat with complete safety, except if you're in a place where you have a right to be, you don't have to retreat at all. See, makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Okay, but that's actually what it says. It's a little convoluted, but basically you don't have to retreat. If you can't do so with complete safety. Well, wait a minute. If I'm in a situation where I'm facing any of those four things that we just went over, how am I in a situation where I can get away with complete safety, even forgetting about the duty to retreat? I mean, the only thing I can think of that is complete safety is, you know, beam me up Scotty. What else is complete safety? You can trip over your own feet. You can turn your back on an ascent. What are you going to do? Of course not. But nonetheless, that's there. The other time you can't use deadly force. To surrender property to a person asserting a claim of right there too. So if the repo guy is trying to take your car, and he may be completely wrong, you may have fully paid your car payment, and he's totally wrong taking your car, you cannot use deadly force. You cannot even threaten that person, you can't do that because they're asserting a claim of right. right? And finally here, see if you get this, you can't use deadly force if you can comply with the demand that he abstain from performing an act which he is not obligated to perform. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. I'll give you an example. You're walking down the street, you're carrying your firearm, there's a whole group of toughs on the other side. And they say, you come over here, you know, we're going to mess you up, make threats, and there's all kinds of stuff on the other side. But you don't have to go to that side. You're just going to keep walking. There's no reason. But you say, hey, this is a free country. I can walk anywhere I want. And you cross that street and walk on their side of the street. Well, you had no obligation. You were not required in any way to do that. And it ends up where you're using deadly force. You're not going to be justified. Because you could abstain from that, right? and you weren't obligated to perform. Finally, uh, you cannot, uh, if you've provoked the use of force and you initiated it or provoked it, you can't claim self-defense. So that's it in a nutshell. What, what does it boil down to? Here's what it boils down to. Some basic rules. If any of you ever have to defend yourself, here's the basic rules you gotta keep in mind. Number one, property, life wins over property. Life wins over property. The most valuable thing you own doesn't even hold a candle to the lowest scum-sucking thug of a person that 
their life, their life, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Life, that life of that horrible, horrible person wins over any piece of property you may have. Property does not cut it. So you just can't use deadly force over property. What is it? It has to be that threat. Threat of serious bodily harm, injury, or death. And what does that mean? What is, what is going to be shown to the jury? And if you say, Evan, is there one thing I need to know that if I ever have to stand trial on self-defense, if there's just one tip you could give me, one thing that would help me to be successful in my defense, I would tell you, yeah, there is one thing that you need to know, that you need to just burn in your brain, and that is fear. You were afraid. You had better have been afraid. The jury is going to want to know that you were afraid. Because if you were angry, you will lose. But if you were afraid for your life, if you were afraid for the life of that other, your hands were ice cold, you just wanted to get out of there and be safe, and you were scared to death that you were going to be injured or killed, you got a much better chance of winning. And I can assure you that if you end up taking the stand in your defense, that that prosecutor is going to come to you and say, Weren't you mad that they were stealing your whatever? Weren't you upset that they had first punched you? Weren't you mad, mad, mad? No, no, no. I was scared. I was in fear. And that's the only reason I did what I did. So that's the tip that can save your life, arguably even. So keep that in mind. And the other is don't be the aggressor. Don't be the initiator. There's an old saying that an armed society is a polite society. If you choose to carry, you're going to have to take a lot of stuff that maybe you didn't take before. You know, maybe you got physical over it or whatever. Are you engaged? Don't even engage. You just got to take it. So keep that in mind. You're not the aggressor. Life wins over property. And anything you do, you'd better be in fear, serious fear for your life serious bodily injury or death coming to you or that other person. Attorney Nathan, yes. uh, we're going to run a little longer if you don't well, mind because we've got a lot of people still well, a few okay. more questions. Sure. Okay, if you don't mind and no one else minds, we're going to go over a little bit. Okay. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Max, would like to ask you another question uh, regarding that subject. Yes. So that question was really a setup <laughs> for you. my follow-up, which was Deadly force, the definition of deadly force. There are two different definitions of deadly force. My problem is, if one person is going after another to commit an assault and they happen to be carrying an object in their hand, do you have to know the mens rea, the state of mind of the attacker? And secondly, do we still follow the old common law rule of alter ego where you have to know that the person you're trying to defend has a lawful right to defend themselves? Well, you have a right to defend the third party or yourself, as we just read. But the important thing here is it's good to know what's the difference between deadly and non-deadly forces. And the law was changed in response to the word bird, where if you display a firearm, display it, it's not deadly force. It's merely force. And there's different thresholds for the use of force. But in that law that I think Dave, you got through, right? It was your Dave bill that helped tremendously. In that bill, they cut, unfortunately, and what we fought it, we tried to stop them, but they cut pointing. So pointing is still a little bit of a gray area, whether pointing, although we'd argue the right to display, so I displayed it by pointing, whether it's deadly or non-deadly force. Fire! No question, you fire that gun at a person on or about them, or at them while they're by a vehicle, and you fire it, you shoot it, it's deadly force. You've used deadly force. The gray area becomes on the display, and that's where it gets a little tight. But if you uh, display a firearm and then stop a matter from progressing, you didn't use deadly force, you used non-deadly force. And you can use non-deadly force to, for example, it's in there, expel a trespass or whatever. But if a weapon becomes presented, you can be assured that you're going to be the one who gets charged. And I've seen this over and over again, particularly in road rage cases, where um, you know, my client 
was the good guy and some nut on the road is trying to run him off the road and act like a jerk and you know here this person's in a vehicle that's itself a weapon cutting them off and all and my client you know, flashes his gun doesn't point just shows him, like back off get away if those people call the police that person who showed the gun is getting arrested on the road rage we have two more questions yes. and then we are going to do our phone okay thing. I'm Skip Murphy with RankRock.com. Hi, Skip. A couple, hi. A couple of moments ago, you mentioned that the military is no longer wanting armed civilians to be guided to their recruiting centers. Yeah, I just spread that. And, and that's true. That's come down not only as a request, but also, um, let me put the context there. We do have a, a number of anti gun social justice warriors who are going out on Twitter and Facebook saying, if you see somebody who is open carrying, like I am right now, call the police. And they're perfectly happy if I get swatted and I get killed, they will rejoice. Now, the, the other thing that I posted on Granite Rock is that there's a direct order from the military brass to tell the recruiting center heads to immediately call law enforcement if they now see people out there standing guard, that they are to go ahead and call the police, tell them there's armed guards, or the, the armed personnel out there, and that they don't know what their intent is. So what happens if there is a swatting that goes on because of this, and what happens with the idea of qualified immunity? Who gets nailed? That's going to be incredibly fact sensitive, and what did the people do if they react when law enforcement showed up? I mean, that's just going to be uh, a huge mess. It would be impossible for anyone to tell you exactly how that will go down. And the problem is it is a genuine threat, these swattings, uh, where they call out on someone who's, who they believe is armed. And then the police have the protocols that they use for dealing with people who are armed. And uh, it, it, it is arguably a formula for potential disaster, absolutely. Who ends up liable? Well. You know, it's tough to sue the sovereign. That's the rule, it's tough to do that. So if you're gonna to try to hold government accountable by way of a lawsuit, it's an uphill climb, regardless of how justified you are. So you, know, you gotta be aware of that. And uh, law enforcement shows up, you better be extra compliant and not do anything that gets anybody scared or hurt. And I mean, a lot of times I'm amazed at the discipline law enforcement has. I mean, I know there are times you see it when they didn't exercise that, but most of the time, I'm like pretty amazed at how much they, they do control uh, themselves in a given situation. Another question, um, because I was reading an article about body armor be becoming illegal. I don't know if it's how much related or information you have on that. Well, it's not illegal yet, and you can, it's not even illegal in New Jersey as long as you don't commit a crime while wearing it. So you can still possess it. Don't commit a crime while wearing it, though. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I just remember reading that they were trying to make it, and I hadn't heard anything further up. No, nothing. Uh, although there have, there have been proposals to do that. There's a number of anti-gun proposals that are being put, you know, put forward federally, but I don't think any of them are going to get anywhere. Uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant, but given the current political climate, especially right before an election, I think, if anything, we're going to see pro-gun stuff pass federally, not anti-gun, but uh, stay, stay informed, stay alert, got to respond I, to this. Yes? I would, I would like for us all to give Attorney Nathan a big round of applause. Greater Epping Republican Committee. Thank you so much for coming and speaking before us. And State Rep. Welch and your wife Carol, you did all a wonderful job. We really thank you and appreciate it. And this has been very enlightening. For everybody's information, uh, I'm being told by Granite Rock that this is going to be live streaming. They are going to put it up on the internet so you can look onto Granite Rock and see it there. Have your friends who couldn't make it, family, look and see it. And uh, Mike uh, with Granite Rock, Mike Rogers, has got brochures if you would like to take brochures for information. Book box. Book box, excuse me. <laughs> and now uh, we are going to draw our raffle prizes. And uh, we're going to ask Diane Gilbert to come forward. And uh, if we can have you uh, draw one of the raffle prizes for us. 
Uh, the gifts, the raffle prizes are down front. Uh, everybody's seen them, I'm sure. Anyone else want to buy a raffle ticket that hasn't been able to buy one? We're all set. He's, she's right there. Okay, He's not, I, have no, I have no ticket, so I have no interest here. But I'll give you that disclaimer. We're going to be drawing for the uh, $25 gift certificate first. There you go. Seven, six, seven, two, eight, zero, one. Who is the lucky winner? There you go. And your prize? It is. Congratulations. Your prize is down front. The ladies out front will give it to you. And the second prize is going to be for the uh, earmuffs. And we would like Representative Welch to draw that one, please. Oh, ladies first. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm forgetting my names. Thank you, Carol. Seven, six, seven, two, eight, one, six. Close that. Oh, good. congratulations, sir. All right. And the next prize is going to be for the uh, gun trap, ammo trap. Seven, six, seven, two, eight, one, two. Here. Oh. Congratulations to you. At this point in time, I would like to thank the Greater Epic Republican Committee, and I want to tell everybody how proud I am to work with these people. The, the group works very hard, and I think I want to let them all have a little bit of recognition about how hard they have worked on this event and all the other events. And um, I want to I want to thank all of them. You really put a lot of effort into this uh, event. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn the closing over to Jeff Harris, our chairman. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I would like to thank each and every one of you for your attendance today. Uh, in particular, I would like to thank specific members of the Greater Reading Republican Committee, they're the ones who work on the programming, of which this is part of their responsibility. Uh, we have the Kindlers standing over to the side. We have Diane Gilbert and Paul Spidell to the rear. We have Mary Clubier, who is uh, keeping an eye on the uh, center aisle. Uh, Rick, who is in the back, who has been with uh, publicity. And uh, with a great deal of fidelity, uh, yeah, I would like to uh, congratulate my son, uh, who is a vital part in the assembly of this program. Uh, that is Andrew Harris. This is not our last program. Okay. This has actually been, I think, our fourth or fifth program that we've done. Uh, we are in the process of planning a, a program in October. The exact date we do not have. The title will be dealing with judicial overreach. Now, I would urge you to keep an eye on our website. Uh, if you don't know it, if you go out on that table, you'll find a red square piece of paper, which will have our website on it. I would ask that you go to that, and we will keep you informed through that. But our next program will be sometime in October, dealing with judicial overreach. Uh, again, my thanks to each and every one of you. Uh, have a safe trip home, and God bless. Thank you.
Brock TV.